All right, everyone. Um, good afternoon, and then welcome to Grow and Sell More Marketable Tomatoes. Um, and thank you all for making time for this today. This should be a really interesting webinar. You know, we're getting into that time of year where um, definitely it can be a few more weeks of um, good tomato harvest. Um, probably also getting to that point in the season where many of us are really tired of this work and maybe thinking about um, things we want to change for next year to make it more efficient and uh, hopefully more profitable. So we'll be talking about different strategies for um, picking and packing and um, selling highest quality fruits for as long as possible in the tomato season. We've got a, a great um, set of speakers here today. Tom Ford from Penn State Extension is going to get us started. Uh, Tom has a tremendous amount of experience with uh, greenhouse production and all manner of specialty crops, including tomatoes. We'll also be hearing from Ken Martin, Director of Ag Operations with Fermano Foods, which is um, definitely one of the, the largest uh, process, processing tomato producers in Pennsylvania in the Mid-Atlantic region. And then finally, uh, Steve Bogash from Marone Bio Innovations, uh, the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic Business Manager for Marone, is gonna be sharing um, some, some tips and insights for um, end of season fertility and, and plant health in tomatoes. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we're gonna keep you all muted um, throughout the session. We do invite you to use the chat feature um, to, to ask questions. We'll pause after each of our, our panelists today to take a few questions and then hopefully have plenty of time um, at the end for, for some wrap up questions. Um, and we will be recording uh, this webinar and sharing it with, with our registrants today so you can come back to some of the information. Um, there will be a survey shared through the chat box um, at the end of the session. Please do uh, take a few minutes just to complete that, that survey. It's super helpful for PASA as we keep trying to improve our programming and, um, and take your feedback into account. So thanks again for coming. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Tom. Thank you, Franklin. Okay, I am going to touch a little bit on uh, just some basics, tomato harvest and a little bit on post-harvest handling. Um, but predominantly, um, as we look to some, some colder weather at our doorsteps perhaps, and maybe uh, an early frost in some locations, um, there may be a need to go ahead and to do some picking as far as some green tomatoes. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that as far as the actual handling of tomatoes um, if you have to harvest green or harvest in a more immature stage. So when we look at the best management practices right off the bat as far as tomatoes are concerned, um, we always want to pick really first thing in the morning. Uh, we want to do it while the fruit is cool. Um, that's probably the best time with almost any crop that we, we pick. We want the field heat to be um, as low as possible. Um, we want to move the fruit typically to a covered area after harvest, and this is mainly to prevent, uh, again, heat buildup, but also to prevent uh, wildlife in some cases from making deposits of excrement on our fruit, unfortunately. Um, the one thing that most people don't realize is that when you do pick tomatoes and you bring them into a packing facility, the packing facility actually should be kept cool. Um, ideally, it likes to be around 59 degrees Fahrenheit in order to um, you know, preserve the quality of the tomatoes as far as after harvest. Um, that's something that is rarely practiced, but it's something that is encouraged. So then we also look at temperature and humidity management. Uh, we do want to get the field heat off um, the fruit as quick as we can. Um, it's going to lengthen the shelf life, typically preserve the quality of the fruit. Again, by picking in the morning, that will typically mitigate um, that issue significantly. One of the things we also have to consider is that tomatoes are very sensitive to chill injury. Um, it's, uh, when we start talking about chill, it's not just the temperature, it's an accumulation factor. So one cool day or one cool um, hour in storage is bad. 
but four or five hours is, is even worse. So um, the accumulation of chilling injury is something significant that we have to avoid. Now, we talk about green tomatoes, and this is something that Steve and I have had ongoing debate for probably about 25 years, has been the quality of a green tomato, or we call mature green, versus something that is vine ripened. And we often hear about mature greens not having the appropriate flavor, the appropriate texture, and we have all sorts of critics that can badmouth a mature green tomato. But a mature green tomato actually has the largest market share of tomatoes um, in the country. And the reason for that is, is that they're easy to ship. They typically have a lower cost, but the real key in preserving quality is how you handle them and how you ripen them. And that's where uh, our debate usually uh, begins and ends because if you are not handling the tomato appropriately after harvest, you're not going to develop a good flavor. And that's where Steve is correct. Since majority of people do not handle green tomato correctly, then the flavor and the ripening will not be particularly um, good. So if you go to USDA, um, you still can pick up the color classification requirements in tomatoes. And I think anyone that's growing in particular for fresh market tomatoes should either download, purchase whatever they can, um, this poster, um, print it up, laminate it, and keep it really where all your workers who are handling tomatoes are. Have it there available. Have them be able to, to look at this poster when you're working with uh, folks in the field. Make sure that they are familiar with basically the color classification requirements for tomatoes. In some cases, we have seen growers um, send their workers out, and what we look at is a very inconsistent harvest from the standpoint of where they're picking the tomatoes. And yet we're gonna treat them all the same once they're harvested. So we'll see tomatoes, everything from mature green all the way up to the red stage in one basket at one time. And unless somebody's grading them out after the fact, it's usually gonna to lead to disaster results if they're gonna to try to handle them after harvest. So we look at the color classification just briefly. Um, green, and we, we call basically the surface is completely green. The breakers, we have a, a break in skin color, usually to a tannish yellow or pink. Um, usually can't cover more than 10% of the surface. We call turning, it's typically greater than 10%, but not more than 30% of the surface in that respect. Um, then we go to pink, where we have more than 30% of the fruit uh, showing color, but no more than 60% of the surface. Then we go to light red more than 60%, but not more than 90%. And then finally red, we're 90% of the surface. Now, it's key to be able to recognize these um, sort of subtle changes in that tomato fruit, because it also governs at what temperature you're gonna store those tomatoes for best results. So let's talk a little bit about storage. Here is a uh, cluster actually of green tomatoes in a, in a tomato greenhouse. Um, we'll see a similar thing in the field, maybe not as large, maybe not as uh, perfect as we see here. Um, but the same science applies to um, high tunnel tomatoes, greenhouse tomatoes, as, as well as field tomatoes. So when we think about harvest, when we think about mature greens, so we're getting approaching fall of the year or we're growing for the mature green market. Mature green tomato, of course, should start to turn just a little bit um, lighter in color, should feel a little bit softer, it shouldn't be hard as a brick. But the real key as far as determining if they reach the mature green stage is actually sacrificing a few tomatoes of the like size that you wish to harvest. So what you do is take a sharp knife, you slice the tomato down the middle, and if you cut the seeds, the fruit is too mature. If it's too immature, it will not ripen correctly after harvest. And then, of course, vine ripen, anything that we call vine ripen, typically it's at a breaker stage. So as soon as it shows a little color, we can say, hey, it's breaking color. Therefore, it can be harvested and actually sold as a vine ripe. So there's a big distinction between the mature green market and then the vine ripen market in that respect. But our point today is mature greens. So here we have a group of tomatoes um, picked uh, locally, all from the field. 
And unfortunately, some of them are misshapen. There's some pollination issues and such. And just to kind of give you an example of what they're gonna look like when you cut them open, okay? So we take two of the greens and you cut them open. And it's a little hard to see. We'll go do a little bit of close-ups, but you cut them open. You'll notice first off that the gelatinous material that sort of surrounds the seeds is kind of very firm, um, not really jelly-like. And actually when you cut, often the tomato seeds will show up very bright white, okay? Because a knife will cut through them rather than sliding over them. We go to the third picture in the middle, you'll see a tomato where it looks a little wetter looking as far as where the, the locules are, where we have a little more gelatinous material. But you'll notice that the seeds have to start to take on a little more yellowish cast. And then we go to that light red, and you can argue that it's maybe even the pink, pink stage. But you can see how that gelatinous material is even more developed. And again, we, our knife uh, sort of glided right over the seed. So again, let's take a look at the light red. We cut through it. And when we see a tomato like this, it tells you right off the bat, we had a pollination issue, okay? A lot of humidity, a lot of moisture, pollen's not shedding right, lots of deformed tomatoes that are out there right now. But you can see that gelatinous material, the yellowing of the seeds, and again, no seeds being cut. We look at this mature green here. We look to the right of the fruit. You can see how it's a little on the wetter side. The seeds are turning yellow. Even though it's a deformed tomato and it has not been pollinated correctly, um, when you look at that tomato, that tomato will ripen appropriately if we follow the, the right protocol after harvest. We go to this one here. If you look at the bottom, look at the white seeds. That shows you where the knife blade actually cut through the seeds, exposing that seed. So that tells you right off the bat, that one there is not at the mature green stage. So when you look at a tomato in some cases, it, it's hard to tell without a little bit of experience of harvesting tomatoes and cutting a few open to kind of get a good feel as far as what is a mature green and what will ripen after harvest versus what will not ripen and taste well um, as you, you approach your frost. So we go to UC Davis. UC Davis is the leader in post-harvest physiology. And they also have this photograph that you can actually, I believe, download, you can view it. And it sure shows basically uh, mature green stage one, mature green stage two, three, four, and the breaker stage where you start to show a little color. And the, the key factor here is, is that you're going to see more gelatinous material develop over time. But the key factor in, in mature green one is the seeds basically are not being cut. So you, you do have actually kind of a range of maturation levels that fall within the mature green stage. If we handle those tomatoes correctly, and we see again, mature green one, mature green two, three, four, and go up to the breaker stage. If the tomatoes are handled correctly, you're not gonna be able to tell the difference between a mature green one and one that's harvested at the breaker stage. So it's a situation is how you handle the fruit after you pick is the real key in having a good quality tomato, even two weeks, three weeks after that first killing frost, if you pick them green. So a few freshness facts. When you harvest tomatoes, um, the preferred cooling method is what we call room cooling. Um, there are people out there that um, basically um, just use like a, a small room air conditioner, a cool bot perhaps to lower the air temperature a little bit, that's one option. But when we think about tomatoes, mature greens have to be kept warm or warmer, probably a better way to put it, 58 to 60 degrees. Pink tomatoes, basically 48 to 50 degrees. So right off the bat, it tells you is if you take mature greens and you subject them to cooler temperatures, those mature green tomatoes are not gonna ripen for you um, very well. Matter of fact, they'll probably show chilling injury. So the thing that right in, your, right in the back of your mind, you got to sort of write on your hand, stamp it somewhere, mature greens have to be kept in a warmer temperature environment to basically store and also to ripen appropriately. We go to pink, we go to red, we can again drop the temperatures a little bit, okay? So other things of storage life. Mature green under the appropriate 
storage conditions can store from 21 to 28 days. Three to four weeks, okay? If you go to a little bit warmer temperature, they can ripen from green in about two weeks time. But if you store them at the appropriate temperature regimen, you can get three to four weeks of storage out of a mature green. Pinks, typically seven to 14 days. And the one thing here we look at here is also optimum relative humidity, 85 to 95%. So um, we typically are not gonna put them in a the refrigerator, but what you have to be conscious of is, is that you need the high relative humidity so that the fruit doesn't shrink, crack, or lose volume. We go to a red tomato, um, typically dead ripe, two to four day storage. Um, we can go cooler, we'll talk a little bit, little bit more about that. So for storage, if you have a light red tomato, we can store them for two weeks or longer at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And yet we can have like a ripe tomato. And as long as we store it lower, at a lower temperature than mature green tomatoes, um, they will have a, a longer storage. Pink to firm red uh, greenhouse grown tomatoes can be stored at temperatures between 50 to 55 degrees. So the key is if it's a mature green, you have to store it warm. Now, with mature greens, we also can look at using ethylene. Um, one way to um, hasten the ripening of those tomatoes is to use ethylene gas to go ahead and expedite the ripening process to create more uniformity in the crop. So to expose tomatoes as far as to an ethylene concentration of 100 to 150 parts per million, usually for about 24 to 28 hours at a warm temperature, 70, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and again, with a high relative humidity of 90%. That will expedite and create a more uniform product um, for your consumer. I talked about chilling injury. If you take a mature green tomato and store it below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, they tend to be more susceptible to alternaria. Alternaria fruit rot, the other name for it is basically, it's very closely related to many of the early bite streams that we see out there on tomatoes. And then we also look at, again, chilling injury is cumulative of a function of both temperature and exposure time. This is another photo from UC Davis. And you take a mature green tomato and you chill it. It does not develop pigmentation. You take the same group of mature green tomatoes, same maturation level, treat them right, they ripen perfectly. So again, chilling injury is a significant problem. This is a situation where you see alternaria where you had 10 days at five degrees uh, centigrade, and you can see the alternate area develop. We had a grower in the um, Sinking Valley area, Tyrone area, Pennsylvania, shipped a bunch of tomatoes to a, a broker. The broker didn't handle the fruit uh, very well, probably kept them too cool. They ended up showing back up at the farmer's doorstep with alternate area. They left the farm clean. They came back two weeks later with alternate area. More than likely the broker kept them too cool after he had taken them from the grower. So we'll leave it there. If there are any questions, we'll go ahead and I'll try to handle those questions for you. Great, thanks Tom. Um, just one question in the chat so far, although please feel free to add more. Um, we have someone asking for clarity what you mean by seed cut. Um, is the seed actually cut in half by the knife? Yes, when you actually uh, take the knife and draw the knife back through the fruit, it actually literally will cut the seeds. And the seeds at that time um, will take on, they almost look white when you make that cut. And in some cases you can actually, if you look at it very carefully, you actually will see where the seed coat has been severed. So it's just like taking a, you know, a knife blade and cleaving it right down the middle of the seed. Um, the <laughs> blade doesn't rotate, doesn't slide off the seed. That's because partially because the material around the seed is still firm and hasn't become squishy so that the seed can kind of slosh right. away from the blade. The, the, right, the knife blade is not going to glide, but also the seed itself is hard, it's very rigid. And again, there's no lubricant around that seed. So when the blade comes down, it just cuts right between, right, right through the seed itself. Great, thanks. Any more questions for Tom? Okay, um, so with that, we'll, um, we'll hear from Ken Martin now. Thanks very much, Tom. Okay, 
Well, welcome to the tomato maturity and packing. We, uh, just a, a quick snapshot of what we do. Um, I work at Furman Foods. Uh, it's a processing company in central Pennsylvania. And my, my job is the ag director. And we do have a farm, Furman Farms, where we grow uh, about 500 acres of processing tomatoes and also about 300 acres of uh, snap beans, uh, green and wax as well. And then we do run a harvesting, we transplant and harvest uh, on those 500 acres and we do own machines. So it very similar to what Tom was talking about on, on the large, the large uh, market tomatoes, we would approach it uh, very similarly. The biggest difference, of course, is we're all machine harvested. So uh, that's, we always kind of term it as destructive harvest, meaning that we get one pass, uh, the plant's actually taken up, run through machine, uh, shaken off the fruit, transfers over to, uh, uh, sorted electronically and is uh, overloaded on a tractor trailer and then uh, transported to the cannery for processing. Um, so it's a very critical part of, uh, of our harvesting is finding the correct time and, and timing to uh, ripen uh, our fruit. Uh, plants we grow for processing, um, the fruit itself is the size of a um, oh, large golf ball to um, maybe um, yeah, golf ball to uh, a little bit bigger, bigger than ping pong. So we're talking small, hard as a rock. Oh uh, wait, that's not a good, good analogy. We're harvesting tomatoes. They're very, very firm, uh, have a small seed cavity and uh, do not, are bred to not um, have a whole lot of uh, water inside because it costs money to cook them down and, and put them into our sauces. Um, but our biggest uh, reason for being, oh, by the way, Franklin, we're, there's only two of us on the East Coast anymore. So I always joke about there's only one of us in Pennsylvania processing tomatoes. The other is a small canner down in uh, New, Southern New Jersey. So we are the only ones in the East Coast that are peeling tomatoes. We'll do it that way. So uh, our process uh, includes um, a very in indeterminate plant, which, which sets fruit uh, about twice. Maybe there's a little bit of crown fruit, then you'll have a, uh, another uh, flush. And basically we get two flushes of fruit flowering on our, on our, uh, on our crop. So that's all we get. We get two shots at it. And so as we approach our, our harvest window, the, the idea is to uh, have all that fruit red at one time. Now, most there are times when um, we don't, that doesn't happen, uh, weather event, um, usually it's weather. So we, we do have to apply a ripening agent. Um, it's the same, it's the same uh, thing as the ethylene gas that ripens your bananas. Wait, we're talking about tomatoes, oh. It also ripens your green mature tomatoes. And much like Tom has described, uh, we, uh, I spend my days uh, walking through fields and cutting green tomatoes. Yes, it's a, quite the life. Um, all I get done is look at green tomatoes. We're, we're cutting them just like Tom was sharing. Um, I've always said the, the seed is immature, which is why it gets cut. It could be because it's, um, there's more more gel around the, the seed itself. And we look for um, seed maturity, which is white. Uh, if, it, if, if your knife cuts the seed, that is not mature. So then we have to make a decision when to apply our, uh, our ripening agent. So we look for color. Of course, there's red fruit on this plant, completely red, ready to harvest. But we have to wait on that second that second set of, uh, of fruit. So anywhere from 65%, 55 to 65% red or pink or even a little higher. 
and then the balance of the what's sitting in the plant is is what we call green. So then you'd need to decide where your green mature, uh, what percent that is, and then then we apply our ripening agent, and anywhere from ten days to two weeks after application is when we uh, usually come to uh, to do the harvesting. And many times when when the harvester arrives at the field, we are picking as high as I like to have eighty five to ninety five percent of red of green fruit. Um, on our harvesters, we do carry uh, mechanical sorting. It's an electric, electric eye that uh, looks at the color and will reject with a rejecting finger off of a belt, kicks the green back on the ground. It also will look at um, extraneous material like um, rocks, uh, dirt balls, and we'll reject those as well. And we do a final sort on our harvester where we have uh, people riding on the harvester and hand sorting. Uh, generally, there is some rot because of the crown fruit that did not make it. And so we do have to sort some rot on the, uh, on the final inspection <clears throat> on the harvester. Um, yeah, that's uh, the biggest thing we, we watch for. And I've been, people have called me and said, oh, can we, can we spray this ripening agent on green market tomatoes? I said, absolutely. If you're looking at it, a beautiful late crop and it's just, and then the weather's starting to turn, uh, the nighttime temperatures slow down harp or ripening, as Tom was pointing out. Um, so you can apply this to a green, uh, they're green mature on your fresh market tomatoes. Now, keeping in mind when you do that, that flips the switch that they're all, they're all going to grow, all going to uh, turn red if, in fact, they're mature. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about rates. Uh, it's a little tricky because rates are, uh, ties back to how much green mature you have. You can spray five gallons of uh, a ripening agent on an immature green tomato. And all you're going to do is knock the leaves off of the plant and that tomato will never ripen. So you need to have the, the green mature. So it's pretty critical to cut and sacrifice some of your green, green mature tomatoes. And then you apply your, your ripening agent. We use uh, Ethafon is the, is the brand name that we apply. And it's, it's just like the gas that you put in your generator to uh, gas your tomatoes, but it's in liquid form. And in, in your ripening houses, the ripening actually affects the green fruit. In our, when we apply it to the plant, it does go through the leaves, through the, through the stems, and, and sometimes into the fruit. But uh, you, you never want to completely defoliate your tomato plant. That, that leaves it wide open for sunburn. Uh, it, it will accelerate the, uh, the red fruit. The, um, won't, it won't keep on the, our field, your field storage almost drops in half if you defoliate. So the, the idea is not to defoliate your tomato plant. Uh, I tell the story, I used to have a grower who said, well, I guess I go out and kill some tomatoes. I said, no, 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 no. You don't want to kill your tomatoes. You want to age them. Okay. Um, but it does, if you apply too high rates, uh, you will defoliate and actually can kill kill the plant. So the, the idea is to 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 age them, and when your when your uh, material works, it actually turns them like a pale yellow, and the plant actually greens up a little. And then you know you had your your rate was perfect. So as a as an ice kit colder cooler, um, you're going to have to increase your rate. Um, for uh, to achieve the what you want to do, but like I said prior to, um, if it's not mature, your material uh, is not going to have the desired effect. So the, um, the best thing for a fresh in a fresh market field is going to be coverage, 
Um, so we grow all on flat ground, no plastic, no, no, no weave, no tie weaves at all. So coverage is really critical. Um, and then uh, we always, when I learned how to do this, we always said, well, you, you, should, you should spray, you should apply this on a rise of temperature. Um, you know, when the temperature is cool, moves up a nice 20 degrees, the plant is actually growing and it, it takes it in. But we learned, um, push came to show, we were spraying in the dark, okay, because of timing. And guess what? It worked in the dark too. Uh, I have a couple of growers who like to spray in the evening. Of course, it's, you know, sometimes it's, um, it's an issue of uh, spray drift where you want to be, have your, your wind speed way down under that five to six mile per hour. But for the plant to take it up, um, you don't want, what you don't want to do is apply it in a, an 85 to 90 degree uh, temperature span. Um, it really, uh, we've had a really a lot of defoliation when we've applied in those uh, temperature parameters. So you want to apply in the evening or in the morning. And rates, it really is dependent. We, we apply our rates by variety, believe it or not. Some of the varieties, we apply a very light rate, 10 ounces, 12 ounces. And then there's an actively growing varieties that we, we apply um, one pint. Uh, this time of year, it's not unusual to apply two pints. Um, so, and then the reaction time, if it's, if the days are shorter and nights are cooler, your reaction time is, is, is extended. So the best thing you can do if you want to experiment with this is, is use a light rate because you can always add, but you can never take away. So a light rate, I would call in, in the fall of the year when you're extending your harvest, uh, the minimum, I wouldn't apply more. The least I would apply would be a pint to the acre. Um, I think the rate goes up. I think it goes to four pint. We've never rarely do that. Our processing tomatoes are, they respond pretty well to, to the ripening agent. So start with a light rate, make sure you got good coverage, keeping in mind that it's all, they're all going to harvest. They're all going to turn red at the same time. If they're green mature, it'll accelerate your pink, your, uh, your pink tomatoes. It'll accelerate them as well. Um, and sometimes it's just a matter of, you know, picking them and not and getting something rather than not getting anything on a uh, green mature. So um, I think that's all I have. Um, the, the it's a very important piece of our our growing program. So you can you want to make sure you keep them healthy. Uh, apply lots of water. Oh wait, proper water. Um, and uh, then the ripening agent does its job. Uh, we've seen where on a, um, a non-irrigated field where there's a split set, you just, you don't get the response. Um, you can spray your ripener and because of half the fruit is red, the other half is immature green, you will kick the immature greens in the ground. So um, I think that's all I have, Franklin. If there's any questions, I'm gladly uh, take a stab at it. Great. Any any questions for Ken? I I had a question, and I don't, maybe Steve might be able to help with this as well. Do you know are there any um, Omri approved ripening agents? You know, Franklin, I'm not aware. I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I saw Steve smile, so I'm, I'm guessing maybe that might be not well, yet. I'm smiling because we had this discussion earlier today. Yeah. Ken and I were having part of this discussion mm -hmm. as we were leading up to this. Um, I'm used to using um, ethanol in grow rooms where um, they will take mature green tomatoes and stack them up and use, um, they, they refer to them as an ethylene generator, but it starts from ethanol that they put in. And, and somehow it, 
the, the little generator starting from ethanol, which is of course, you know, a consumable alcohol, um, it'll generate ethylene, which will speed the ripening of tomatoes. It's a real acrid kind of a smell when you go in the room. I, I'm guessing that probably, I would talk to PCO about the process before I went and tried it, but this is not for at what, what, what uh, Ken is talking about is using ethophon that you apply directly on these. And mm -hmm. so, um, I, I don't know any substitute for that that would be organic, but um, in a grow room, I can't imagine where ethanol that would generate ethylene would be a problem, but that would certainly be a good conversation to have with PCO or your certifier. Great, thanks. And Ken, you mentioned um, you know, the, the ripening agent, of course, the variety, and then also irrigation. Are there any other, maybe some, some top cultural practices you use to set yourself up for consistent ripening dates? The biggest thing, uh, Franklin, is you never want to interrupt uh, the growth uh, of, a, of the tomato, either by too much water, um, too much nitrogen will we'll do it very nicely. Uh, of course, and not enough water where you have a, where it splits the, uh, the sets. So, you know, the best thing is, is to keep them happy. I mean, that's as best you can to your ability. And then you will always, keyword there, you'll always get a, a response to your ripening agent, um, at least on the varieties we grow. So as long as, as long as you have not interrupted the, the plant's growth at all, or Mother Nature hasn't done that. Um, it's amazing um, how well that, that ripening agent does work. Great, thanks. Okay, I think we'll, we'll move on and, and hear from Steve Bogash now. So can you see my screen now? Yes, we can. Good. Okay, it's on. It's on my other screen, so I'm going to constantly cock back and forth to take a look. So I'm still looking at the crown camera. So this is the end of season edition for uh, growing and selling tomatoes. The image that you're looking at is uh, typical yellow shoulders, um, and you could have seen this a lot earlier. But this is this is really classic yellow shoulders here. The tomato itself is completely ripe but you still see that yellowing. That'd be a hard white core all the way down through. And um, you, you manage that by man largely managing your potassium. Um, you need to have two and a half to 3% potassium by tissue in your tomatoes to manage that. Uh, we'll talk about the nutrition a little bit more once I figure out how to, there we go, there's a the forwarding button. So these are end of season pest challenges. We're gonna talk about nutrition at the end of this, but I wanna make sure we have plenty of time to talk about pests. Um, spider mites. So the outdoors at this point, we're probably starting to see the end of spider mites. They're not a real cool season pest and we've had a couple cool days, but it has been relatively dry and um, they can definitely do some serious damage. We'll talk about how to manage these. Um, I'm going back and forth between indoor and outdoor. A lot of folks have high tunnels and they want to hold them as long as possible. In a high tunnel, spider mites are just absolutely devastating. They never get washed off and keeping them under control toward the end of the season gets to be a, certainly a bigger hassle. Um, aphids are always a challenge. White flies are typically an end of season challenge. They typically will attack older plants. You don't often see them outdoors, although they can be, but for indoor growers, high tunnel or greenhouse, white flies are a true end of season disaster. The honeydew that they put out can be devastating on, on them. And we're always looking to manage Western flower thrips. Our specific end of season diseases are botrytis, uh, late blight and leaf mold. So we do have some reports of late blight now. I believe they're still in New York, but they're always a concern this part of the season. Um, and late blight is a devastating. So I know most of this is a pasta call. So most of the growers are gonna be organic or with an organic bent. Um, and um, managing late blight can be a real challenge. And we're gonna be talking about that a little bit. Um, Botrytis gets to be a really big deal for indoor growers. You've got a lot of foliage you've accumulated. As somebody who has harvested many tons of tomatoes by hands over the years, um, it's one of the worst things you can do is when you're reaching into a plant and you pull out a gooey tomato, one that you missed or that botrytis got to. Um, and so we're going to be talking about how to manage that. 
little bit about leaf mold, and it doesn't mean you get off the hook for those summer diseases, early blight, um, anthracnose, which can look an awful lot like Tom was showing pictures of alternaria, um, anthracnose, which is Colotoctrichum acutatum most often on tomatoes. Um, it looks an awful lot like alternaria on tomato fruit. You get that typical lesioning and septoria leaf spot. So we'll get into some programs for managing these. Um, so this is late blight. Um, and so late blight is, uh, so far, it's not a really big deal in, um, in Pennsylvania, but we do have some reports, so it's one that I get concerned about when I hear reports. When we get storm-driven rain, the uh, number that we used to use when I was with Extension was that it would move 50 miles in a day in a storm. I think it can move a lot further depending on the kind of weather. So when you look at your tomatoes, you'll see that image there in the center. Um, that's usually around the time that most folks part, start to see. You'll see um, this uh, looks like axle grease, not the grease itself, but the color. Um, but you'll see this uh, on the fruit. This is really typical of late blight. When you start looking on the leaves, that leaf on the right, you can see these uh, irregular um, lesioning on there uh, with the spore masses. If you look at it at the end of the day on a dry day, you won't see it sporulating um, early in the morning um, or when the humidity is high, you'll see it. And here you can see in that image on the left, you'll see when late blight is just really at the full foam stage. Uh, waiting for a lab to diagnose can be a real big problem. So it's a, there's a real easy tool for diagnosing late blight if you believe you have it. Uh, you take a one gallon Ziploc bag, you put a paper towel or two in there, you can put a couple of affected leaves or leaves you su su suspect or some fruit that you suspect, put them in the Ziploc bag, put them in your refrigerator for 24 to 48 hours and take a look. So often when you put it into the fridge, the fruit will look a lot like in that center image where you won't see much going on, but you can see some lesioning. But when you pull it out of the refrigerator in 24 to 48 hours, you'll see the white foaminess. The paper towel helps to manage the moisture in the bag. The temperature really works well for um, bringing out the late blight on the plant. Um, and if you see this, the likelihood that you have late blight. If you see the white foaminess, and you can see it around the edges of the leaf, um, around the edges of the lesion, or you'll see it around the lesioning on the fruit, um, the likelihood that it's late blight is really high. There's a buckeye blight that looks somewhat similar. We very seldom see that in Pennsylvania. So this is a really easy on-farm test that you can do. If you've got late blight, um, the plants that you know you've got it on have to be destroyed immediately. Copper is going to be your friend. There are a lot of late blight materials. And if you want to get into synthetics, I will gladly have a long discussion with you about how you can manage all of that. There are a number of good synthetic materials. You can look in the Pennsylvania or the Mid-Atlantic Veg Guide, um, Randman, Previcure, Flex, and others. For organic growers, uh, this is going to be a combination of regalia and copper. That does a nice job of slowing it down. You're going to slowly lose plants. In an organic regimen, without the systemic materials, you're going to slowly lose plants. But it's a battle you can win if you stay on top of it. You've got to continue to keep sprays on to the very end, and you can manage it you will lose plants. I've seen growers lose their entire fields to late blight, but it's a manageable problem. So botrytis is the other one. By now, indoors, and this is primarily an indoor problem, by now, if you have high tunnel or greenhouse tomatoes, you've got a lot of foliage. There's a lot of place where you've tied vines over top of one another. We close them up when we get nights like last night that got down below 50 degrees. We wanna preserve the heat. That just builds up humidity. Botrytis is one of those uh, spores that stays around with us all the time. It is ubiquitous to our production environment, and it's always waiting for the right conditions, which is largely humidity. For most of us, it's when the humidity spikes. So you can see on that fruit on the left, those are lots of places that an individual spore landed and it bloomed, and it, comes, it causes these circles. That, that fruit will not be a number one fruit when you get to the end of the season. Uh, but you can see where that cut is on the image in the center. Um, that is very typical of a, a kind of botrytis attack that you'll see on a cut wound. And then over on the right, um, it can rot the fruit as well. So 
increasing ventilation is a huge deal um, in our houses. Again, this is not much of an outdoor problem, although it can be. This is a typically an indoor or a high tunnel problem. Increasing ventilation, removing foliage, doing everything you can. Um, there are some chemical controls, or I should say some, some organically uh, acceptable chemical controls that you can do, and we'll get to that in a moment. So leaf mold is the other one we, we will often see. Now, there are some varieties that are resistant. Red Mountain is one, and I forget the name of the other, but there are a few varieties. Oh, Red Deuce is also very resistant to leaf mold. Um, you, know, you will almost never see leaf mold on a fruit, but it will certainly degrade your vine. So if you're trying to keep your indoor tomatoes um, through October and into November, this gets to be a real problem because it'll really damage the, uh, all the chlorophyll. And you can see the, uh, the, how, how the uh, um, leaves are starting to lose chlorophyll where this is attacking. Very easy to diagnose leaf mold. You'll see this blotchiness, this lack of chlorophyll on the top of the leaf. And you look on the bottom and you'll see this little fuzziness immediately under there. Um, you want to, for next year, you want to look at alternative varieties, but by maintaining a strong fungicide program to the end of the season, you can go a long way to reducing leaf mold. And again, this is one that really thrives in a, a high humid environment. So anything you can do to increase ventilation is going to reduce leaf mold. By now, you've probably seen, if you're going to see some, you've probably seen the beginning of it. And remember, we're going to come back to this at the end. You can always remove all of the leaves below the lowest fruiting cluster on your plants and have no, no disruption in plant activity at all. And that does a huge amount to increase ventilation. So this is an organic program for disease management. And as I mentioned earlier, I, I primarily put this one on to preserve time, but also since this is a PASA um, or organized meeting, if you want to talk about this for uh, synthetic growers or conventional growers, I'd love to talk to you about that for more. So this is a basic um, maintenance kind of program for disease management that'll work pretty well on all of the diseases that we've been talking about. So regalia plus badge, which is an, this badge X2 is a copper. Um, you see the rates on there. Rotated Distargus plus Actinovate um, is a, this is an excellent management program for doing this. You're going to want to apply it at least once a week. You may have to, if you're on a high pressure environment, you may have to be applying this every four to five days. The only uh, product on here that has a PHI challenge, meaning how long before you spray and can harvest, or not to harvest, but how, how soon you can handle it, um, is badge, which is a copper. So make sure if you're using copper materials, you are aware of what the PHI is. They run 24 to 48 hours. You've got some other really good tools for helping to manage disease indoors and out. Um, the PAAs, the peroxyacetic acids or the paraacetic acid. My company sells Jet Ag 5, so it's listed first here. There's also Oxidate 2 and Oxidate 5, Zero Tol and others. These peroxide materials are really good tools in a high human environment because they oxidize all your disease causing spores, whether they're bacteria or fungal. Anything that is on the outside of your plants, assuming you get good coverage, you will destroy the mycelia, you'll destroy the spores. Reducing inoculum goes a long way. Sometimes we get three days of rain uh, with no sun whatsoever. You may have to spray a peroxyacetic acid material every morning. Uh, just to keep the inoculum down. You'll note on all of the labels, and I'm mostly familiar with the Jet Ag 5 label, that there will be two rates on there. One is a curative rate and the other is a maintenance rate. So if you're already looking at diseases, I recommend you go in with the higher curative rate as an initial dose and then go over to the maintenance rates after that. Please follow all label instructions and make sure you wear proper PPE when you're doing this. These peroxide materials, especially on exposed skin, they're um, as a concentrate, you can bleach your skin and it makes a tingly feeling. I did it the other day when I was working with some, but you can apply them really often. There are some other bacillus materials out there. Um, Cease is one that I have used often. It's a bacillus subtilis material that you can add into this program to help boost your overall control. There's also the potassium bicarbonate materials, calagreen, armacarb, millstop. All of these materials, do a, they're very high pH. 
And so they do a really nice job of preventing disease by, by putting this high, high pH material on leaf surfaces. You only get to use potassium bicarbonate about once a month. It's really hard on the waxy cuticle that protects leaves. So don't try and use this over and over again, but it's a good material to use on occasion. Do not burn your leaves. As, as Ken, I thought, emphasized really well, you cannot have good tomatoes unless you've got healthy leaves. On the opposite end, so potassium bicarbonate raises the pH on the leaf surface. There are citric acid materials like prositic that will reduce the pH on the leaf surface and get a very similar effect. Most of the organisms we're talking about have a, um, it's, it's not, I wouldn't call it a narrow pH range, but it's narrow enough that by blasting them with high pH and low pH materials, you can actually uh, accomplish quite a bit of control. The plants are a lot more tolerant of citric acid being used more often than they are potassium bicarbonate. So notes on tank mixing. Um, you can apply a lot of different materials into, um, into the tank. Um, and so, you know, take good notes as you're doing this. If you're doing a mix that you've never tried before, do the jar test on it first. Jar test is simply mixing the materials up in the proportions that you're going to use and observe what happens in the jar. If you get a precipitate, you get materials that are settling out. Um, the jar heats up, the jar explodes. These are all under, these are all bad things. You probably should discard that and not use that. And uh, assuming you get none of that within 20 minutes of mixing, and it's a new tank mix, apply it to a few plants, give them 48 hours. If you don't see any leaf burning, you're probably in good shape and can go ahead and do that. Copper and regalia are a really great mix. Never, ever, ever apply copper with a PAA, with any of the parasitic acid materials. It's a, it immediately starts reducing the copper. Um, it, I've never gotten as far as applying it on a plant, but in your spray tank, it will make a lot of goo and it'll turn it black. It's not something you want. So you never apply a metal with a PAA, and copper is obviously a metal. Um, the same would have apply with micronutrients like zinc or manganese, never with a PAA. Um, a note, regalia is really nice to use this time of year. It will help stimulate chlorophyll B, so it'll help your, keep your plants not only healthier, but it'll stimulate some extra chlorophyll in your plants. As we get shorter days and reduce light levels, both from the angle of the sun on, on our plants, but also the kind of weather we're getting, having additional chlorophyll can make a really big difference to help bring those plants home and get your final, um, final yield in. You can apply it as a drench. A uh, typical rate is going to be one ounce per gallon as a drench. We can talk about acreage. I'm a real big fan of these kelp-based materials. Stimplex is the one that I have used most, but just about every organic fertilizer company has some kind of a kelp-based material. They act as biostimulants. They do a lot to help keep your plants healthy, and they are very worthwhile to add in. Plus, they tend to be really tank mix friendly. So let's talk about insects. So for me, in the fall, public enemy number one are white flies, um, and they they tend to build up really quickly. So one of the quick things um, that I note is I will often get phone calls from folks that believe they have white flies, and um, they will typically you more often than not their aphid castings. So one of the big differences between a white fly and an aphid castings is when you come into your house. If you wave your hand over top of your white flies, they will fly around. Aphid castings are just the spent skin of aphids. And look on the bottom of the leaf above where you see their castings, you'll probably see an aphid colony there. It doesn't make a big difference in your management, but white flies are very, very tough to manage, and aphids are just one we manage all the time. It's the honeydew from the white flies and the aphids that are the really big problem. Spider mites. I put two really extreme images on here. If you get to the point where you see webbing, you've lost control at that point. And you can see this indoors or outdoors. You're never going to get control back from once you get webbing. This is a prevention program that you should have started a lot earlier. Um, if you've got spider mites and they are at this level, it's time to clean your planting out and plan what you're going to do next year. And we're going to get into control programs before we get very far. Um, but spider mites will stipple. Um, they will reduce the vigor. They can definitely take your crop out. 
If you see webbing, you are past that point. Also, aphids in Western flower thrips are a constant problem. Um, aphids this year, I don't, I don't know that I've gone a week this year without getting uh, calls from tomato growers about aphids. Um, they get active at 50 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and so this is the green peach aphid. That's our biggest problem. Um, they are juice suckers. They also will, their honeydew will uh, cause a sooty mold to grow on tomatoes. So our tolerance is really low. And Western flower thrips, um, they can reduce your fruit to looking like you see in the image on the right, but they also will help to bring in quite a number of viruses. And so the idea is you want to keep them at a zero. It's really easy to scout for Western flower thrips. First off, if you see little blotches on your foliage that appear silver, um, it's the only thing that looks like this. It's like a grayish silver. Um, you've got Western flower thrips. So that's a good sign you've got them but you can also grab hold of freshly opened flowers. You grab it at the base of the lowest petal and do a quick blow in there with your warm breath. And the combination of the warmth and the carbon dioxide will cause the little thrips to come running out. It looks like a little tiny pencil dash. Um, if you see them, you've got a problem and it's time to manage and we will get into some controls. So this is my graphic way of managing all of these small sucking and, and rasping insects. So this will include, include russet mites, broad mites, spider mites, um, aphids, white flies, mealybugs, western flower thrips. So uh, the way that I've tried to picture this, um, and, and so these, some of these are my product. That's my transparent part. Most of these are not. So the way that I manage these, and this has worked really well for a lot of growers, is you just go on a preventative program from the beginning of the season, where week one you are applying either Grandivo or Venerate, the next week you are applying all the other product. But I always use them with one of these tank mix partners that you see in the second row. That's why the strange arrows in the middle. So let's assume that this is week one and um, we're gonna go into an insect mite management program. So we take Grandivo and you tank mix it with any of the products in the next row down. So in the first block on the left, you'll see MP, Desex, or Copa. These are all these potassium salt soaps. Um, I, may, I use those at 2% in these mixes. It's nice, they act as a spreading agent, but they also give you some insecticidal activity and they'll help with powdery mildew. Um, and so those are three different brands of what are basically the same product. Or you could go with one of the Aza, Aza, Aza Directin materials. Um, I've worked with Aza Direct, Aza Guard, Multex, and Nemix. So that would be another possibility for a tank mix partner or use Bavariana bassiani, which are, um, I know Botanigard and Mycotrol. Um, I believe there's also bio series out there. And then you come back the next week. So we started with Grandivo. Next week, you use Venerate and you use a different one of these tank mix partners. And the big drill here is we often will see resistance build up in spider mites and Western flower thrips. And Western flower thrips are the poster child for developing resistance. With this kind of a program, it's very, very difficult with all these multiple modes of action to develop any kind of resistance. So you also see around the outer edge, I put there's some other green blobs with other products in them. And I put those there because they, I like to use those infrequently. And let's start with the product on the lower left, which is in trust, which is the organic version of spinosad. And then there's radiant, which is um, same mode of action, slightly different chemistry, but it is, it is a conventional material. You can always use that as a knockdown. So if you see uh, Western flower thrips and the basic management program we were just talking about, about the work, then you can throw some in trust or radiant into the tank get a knockdown and then you put that material back away again. And the reason we don't want to use that is Western flower thrips have developed resistant to these spinosad type materials. You don't want to have that in your house. These are important tools to use. Use them when you need them and then put them back away. The same with the pyrethrums. Uh, pyrethrums are a great way to knock the heck, and I'm thinking pyganic here, um, and azera. Azera is py basically pyrethrum along with an aza material. Um, they're good for knockdown, but we know that there's the possibility for resistance. So that's a great way to knock aphids back. Uh, the portal at Oberon, that's only for synthetic users. 
really strong and powerful um, spider mite materials. Oberon actually kills their eggs. Um, if you are not certified organic, these are very powerful materials you can introduce to knock a spider mite um, infestation back, back. You would add that to the rest of this program and then put that material back again away. Oberon is interesting and it's one of the few ovicidals. It actually kills eggs. And then if you're dealing with caterpillars, you stay with your basic program, but you introduce one of the Bacillus thuringiensis materials, Dipel, Javelin, or Thuricide. I, I really need to update this slide. So by Dipel, Javelin, and Thuricide are all BTKs. These are Bacillus thuringiensis kirstakis. They work on many caterpillars. Uh, right now in uh, cent very central Pennsylvania here in the Cumberland Valley, we've got uh, yellow striped armyworms and they're in the beet armyworm family. Those BTKs don't work well on yellow striped armyworms or anything that's in the armyworm or earworm family. But if you substitute out to a, B, a BT, a, a or a BT Azawi strain, um, and that's Zentari and Agree, they do a much better job on army worms and earworms. So there are two, remember, there's two different strains of BTA, BTs out there, and it matters which one you use. So I realize this is a tomato program. If you're managing loopers on your cabbage and broccoli, um, BTK, like Dipel, Javelin, and Thuricide work well. But if you're trying to manage Diamondback, you need to use BTA. It matters. These strains matter a lot. And you'll see some other things on there. Um, so let's move into nutrition as we wrap up the season and wrap up this presentation. So um, the real big deficiency that I see this time of year is magnesium. I get lots and lots of tissue samples sent to me because I work in nutrition for quite a while. And the number one nutritional deficiency I've been seeing all season long is magnesium. You really need 0.8 to 1% magnesium in relationship to all these other nutrients in order to get great tomatoes. Magnesium is really important in photosynthesis. And so getting it there is a real challenge and keeping it there with a load of fruit can be a real challenge. And it's easy to recognize it. Um, so, oh, this is, I, I, I should have put this slide. Let's, we'll come back to magnesium. I obviously had this it's a, a little out of order from where I wanted it. So this is yellow shoulders. And as I mentioned, yellow shoulders is all about potash at the time you're setting the fruit. Um, the fruit at the top is actually the one I showed in that opening image, but cut down through and you can see that white hardening part. These fruit will never get better. Um, once that fruit sets, you can dump all the potash you want into your tomatoes. This is, you gotta have your potash levels above two and a half percent and preferably above 3% at the time you set that fruit in order to prevent this. And you can see on the uh, grape type tomatoes, they get it really bad, especially when you got a heavy set. And this whitening all around the uh, outer part of the tomato in this ripe tomato, this is actually on a BHN 589. You can see this is all very typical yellow shoulders slash uneven ripening, gray wall, ghost wall. You'll see lots of names for this. All this goes back to your potash levels when you set that fruit. So calcium is still a really big deal. As we get into the end of the season, your plants are using less water, therefore they're gonna move less calcium and you can get back into late season blossom end rot. Doesn't have to be on the blossom end, but that's where we see it most. And you can see in that image on the right, um, you can also get it on peppers. Peppers get blossom end rot just, just fine. This is all about keeping your potash, your uh, calcium levels at about 3%. And so we're starting to build up now where you want your potash at 3%, your calcium at 3%, your, pot, your magnesium at about 1%, and most of these kind of nutritional problems go away. I do a lot of tissue sa sampling. Um, most important part on this next slide is to remember that calcium is not mobile in the plant. Uh, most the magnesium is very mobile, nitrogen is very mobile. You have to have enough calcium in the soil which means it has to be in that water stream. It has to be moving in the xylem. If you're not watering very often, um, it's, uh, you're not gonna move calcium. And so this is one of those places that foliar calcium can make a small difference. If you're an organic grower, talk to your fertilizer supplier about getting an amino acid chelate of calcium. Almost all of them carry one, and that can help you get to maintain these kind of levels while you're still making sure that there's plenty in the soil.
These are all these sources that I was just talking about. At this point in the season, um, I'm only going to focus on calcium chelates. So if you're not organic, look for an EDTA chelate. The one I see most often is Miller's, but there are others. If you are an organic grower, again, talk to your fertilizer supplier about an amino acid-based calcium. Um, they, they make a huge difference. You can apply them foliar and your plants will take them up very quickly. So this is magnesium deficiency. And the image on the right is an extreme but what you will often see is a blotchiness or a lightening of the leaves. When I walk into a house now, I can see it almost immediately. Um, and you'll see a real strong lightening of the leaves. You, what you will lose is vigor um, and calcium and magnesium and potassium. These are all these uh, covalent double charged uh, ions. Plants take them up in balance. When any of them get out of balance, it will cost you money. Um, this is more, uh, we've covered all of this. So reducing cracking, this is all about watering. Uh, Ken had mentioned, he had made a comment about, you don't want them, the plants to stop growing. You wanna keep a nice even growth on them. And so this is all about really even watering. Um, I put a picture of sun golds here because they are the poster child for cracking. I swear I have carried uh, totes of sun golds out of my research plots where I know every one I picked did not have a crack. And by the time I set them on the sorting room table, a third of them were cracked. Some varieties are just absolutely terrible for that. Um, but the more even you irrigate, the less cracking you're going to see. Uh, one of the interesting things that we've seen the last couple years are these uh, transpiration managing foliar materials. Uh, we're still figuring out how to use them best. Um, so Marone sells a product called Haven. That does, that does this, it increases transpiration, therefore it's gonna move more calcium. And then uh, uh, BioBest has a product called Blue Stim, which is, a, I think it's a soybean extract, both of them. I don't know that either of these are organic, but both of them will promote transpiration. I know our Haven product is not. Um, you could check with the folks at BioBest and see whether or not uh, their Blue Stim product qualifies as organic or check with your certifier. So a couple closing thoughts. Um, we're at the peak of the summer season, it takes about 35 days to go from a fruit set to a ripe tomato. We are no longer at that point. And so you need to start looking critically at your tomatoes. It now, if, if, I was to, if I was to set a fruit today, so I have a flower, it is pollinated and fertilized, um, you're at least 45 days for a slicing tomato at this point in the season before it's ripened. So if it's outdoors, it hasn't got a chance. We're way past that. Indoors, you need to start looking at um, the way your crop is going. So if you're outdoors, anything that's flowering now hasn't got a chance. You're not going to ripen it. But if you're indoors, you've got to start asking questions. And whether you're in a tunnel, a heated tunnel, or a greenhouse, are you planning on heating right now through the end of October? So that flower that sets today, you would need to keep that flower warm all the way until the very end of the season, um, which is gonna be the end of October right now. Are you planning on keeping the place warm enough to ripen that fruit? If it's not, and I was talking with some growers about this last week and early this week, it's actually worth your while, especially on determinate tomatoes or semi-determinates, to go in and lop off all that foliage that is now hanging over the top of your trellising. It's useless, it's not gonna set any decent fruit, it makes it hard to spray and work, and it's very freeing to take it out of there. Make sure your clippers are nice and clean and all that, but anything above the top of your stakes that's setting fruit at this point, the likelihood of your ripening that is really, really low. I mentioned earlier, one way to improve ventilation and reduce some of those diseases I mentioned is any of the lowest foliage on your plant. If it's below the lowest fruiting cluster, cut it off. That will increase ventilation. It gets out of your way. It's easier to find tomatoes. It's easier to spray. It's going to help with humidity management. This is a really worthwhile job to do. And do not leave those leaves laying on the ground in your tunnel or greenhouse. You want to haul them out. Um, so uh, also, while you're doing that, any thinning that you can do of the vines to increase flow, I have, there's so many times that I have been harvesting tomatoes in my tunnels and have reached in just to find a botrytis ridden gooey tomato um, just hanging there. And now your hands are all covered with that. You've got to clean up before you go back to harvesting. 
any thinning you can do, any removal of fruit that you know are not gonna perform well, all of these will really pay off. But I think the biggest thing to think about, if you've had indoor tomatoes that are going, um, is do you wanna keep them still going much longer this season? Do you have a market for them is always the question. Are there enough fruit there to make it worthwhile? Um, or are you better off to clean your tunnel out as early as possible and try and go a, grow a cover crop in there to improve your soil? I think this is a really good question to ask yourself because I've been in so many tomato houses where you look around and you know the plants have three or four tomatoes on them that might ripen yet this year. And you start thinking about the economics of even turning the heat on and it's just not worthwhile anymore, especially if you've had these plants in the ground since late March or early April, they're pretty beat up. Sometimes you're just better off to punt, remove all the vines, clean up your house and grow a cover crop and get ready again for next year. And I will leave you with some beautiful pictures at this point. So are there any questions for me? Thanks so much, Steve. Any questions? I, I have one maybe while, while some folks get to typing. Um, I'm just kind of curious your, your thoughts and maybe rules of thumb from other participants for, you know, um, these fertilizer pest control products are obviously, you know, they have costs associated with them. As we get into mid-September, how do you think about when it's time, when it's worthwhile to, to keep up the fight and when to just kind of uh, throw in the towel, I guess, on, on, on pest control or, or fertility? Well, I, I think this, this is, I, well, I, I, I hoped I was addressing that some. You've got to look at the fruit that are hanging there. So if you've got fruit, and this goes back to um, Tom, what Tom was talking about with mature greens. So we don't have a lot of season left. We are at the 16th of uh, September right now. The typical first frost for a lot of Pennsylvania is going to be the second week in October. We've had them earlier. We've had them later. So you got to look at the uh, um, you got to look at what you've got out there and determine whether or not there's potential to hold on to them. If you don't keep the plants healthy, well, you just threw that potential in the garbage. So a lot of that has to do with the load and part of the reason. So Franklin, when you first approached me about doing this end of season thing, um, one of the pictures I had in my mind was I have visited so many operations over the years where this last harvest that they're getting ready to do over the next couple of weeks, these final harvests, carried them for an extra month of sales. If your plants aren't healthy, you're not going to get those extra sales. So it's there is a you have to figure out when are you going to do that harvest? Um, do you have the fruit that's going to make it worthwhile to do? So you're going to look at the quality of your fruit. I like the uh, one picture that Tom showed. It was a cluster of, of green tomatoes that looked really healthy. If you've got clusters like that, I'm excited to ride it out. If you've got just a few fruit hanging there and they're already not pretty, it's time to be done. Walk away from that. The, the, the season does not go on forever. And this has been a hard season anyhow. Thanks, that's, that's helpful perspective. Um, I'm also curious if you have some recommendations on um, how frequently and at what point of time what point in the season to do tissue testing for those nutrient levels? So um, I do tissue testing every two weeks, um, starting four weeks after I transplant. To me, that's just a, it's a really simple rule. Um, I cut off tissue sampling uh, two to three weeks before I believe I'm going to pick my last fruit. That's, that's, I, but I, I'm, I definitely go a fairly strong tissue testing program. I have a strong belief that tissue testing makes money, but when you're three weeks from picking that last fruit, it really doesn't matter very much. You, you, your, your tomatoes are on a glide path and it's probably even time to put away your nutrients for the season. I think this, this gets to be a, a high tunnel oriented question. So if you did a late planting uh, in your tunnel or your greenhouses and you're gonna try and hold them till November, you still need to do some tissue sampling. However, if you look at your leaves, especially your lower leaves and they're blotchy yellow, which 
probably indicates a magnesium deficiency. That doesn't take much of a tissue sample. I wouldn't spend the 25 or 30 bucks. I'd just get some more magnesium going to those plants to try and hang on to them a little bit further. This is, these are all these end of season variables. It's really tough to figure out how to do this perfectly, but we are getting to the last tissue sample. Great. Any other questions for, for Steve or for Tom or Ken? Okay, well, um, really appreciate you all tuning in today. Um, you probably noticed in the chat box, there is a um, link to a, an evaluation form. Again, please help us out and fill that out. It just takes about three or five minutes. Um, we'll be sharing a recording of this uh, probably tomorrow or Friday. And um, I think as you saw on some of those slides, uh, Tom and Steve have shared their contact info. So I'm assuming they're, they're open to follow up questions and I certainly am as well. Um, so I hope uh, you've gotten some uh, helpful perspective and insight today. And uh, also certainly want to thank Tom, Steve, and Ken for, for making time for this. So thank you all. And um, yeah, enjoy the afternoon. Hope, um, hope you do get that last month of uh, tomato harvest. Real pleasure. See you all in virtual meetings all winter. <laughs> all right, take care, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, Franklin. I'll give it one more minute and, and then I'll end the meeting. Thanks, Gina. Yep.